What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 259. I am your host. My name is Marshall. I've got a guest host with me this week. As you may have imagined, I've got one next week, too. And <laughs> we're just going to keep doing the guest host thing. I'll talk to you guys about that in a little bit. Before I do, though, got to mention our sponsor, Card Kingdom. Dot com. One of the great websites to visit if you're into magic. If you, uh, if you need sealed product or singles, you like to get in and get out, Card Kingdom is the place to go. They're going to get you your product very quickly. Their website is very streamlined, right? It doesn't have any of the extra stuff. It's just get in there, get your stuff in your shopping cart, get it ordered, and they're going to get it out the door to you as quickly as possible. They pay attention to the details. This is one of the great things about Card Kingdom is like they, they call it – a courtesy flap. They will take, if you look and you order a little plastic box worth of cards, they will tape them up in shipping so that they don't move around or get damaged. But they even go the extra step and they'll actually fold the little piece of tape over so that you can take it off. How cool is that, right? And it's these little things that add up to make a great customer service experience at Card Kingdom. And that's why I feel very comfortable recommending that you go uh, check out their website and even put it in order over there. So cardkingdom.com, please do check that out. Um, also, if you'd like to sp- support the show more directly, uh, Patreon is the place to do it. We have a Patreon page set up on patreon.com slash limited resources. And uh, it's a way that you can give directly to the show to support it uh, right directly to us. Uh, It's a great website. It's been a a great success and fantastic. You can also get access to some pretty cool stuff. For example, at one of the levels on the Patreon, uh, I actually put up an uncut copy of the show every week. I I put it up a couple hours before the other show goes up, but that's just coincidental. Uh, But I don't edit it. So you get to hear any uh, chatter beforehand and after with uh, with my guest or the host, um, and then maybe even in between. Usually, there's no screw ups. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> that will be the case for this show. But occasionally, things can get messed up in the middle, and you get to hear us, you know, drop our water on the table and freak out or whatever. But anyway, a bunch of cool stuff there uh, at Patreon. So uh, so please check that out as well. Now, why don't we move on though to our special guest? This is I'm I'm really happy to have uh, this this guest host on. He has supported the show since the inception of it. Basically, um, I remember seeing his comments on as early as I believe the second episode of the show, and he has been absolutely one of our our greatest supporters um, ever since. And uh, we couldn't couldn't thank him more. But having him on the show. Actually, because of what he's done, it's not just because he's a great listener, but it's because he's actually started putting out some really great content on his own. It's Matthew Watkins. Matthew, welcome. Oh, thanks, Marshall. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm super stoked to have you on. Uh, So, Matthew, you do the Ars Arcanum. Is that how you say it? Or you say Arcanum? I say Arcanum, yeah. Okay, Ars Arcanum. Arcanum, Yep. Uh, uh, Article series for Pure MTGO. Uh, yeah. dot com and uh we're actually going to be diving into the ins and outs of your your column um for our main topic uh we're going to take it as sort of a two parter first i'm going to have you walk us through your thought process on how you actually uh write the column and also what people can expect to get out of the column, what they shouldn't expect to get out of it. Uh, it's a very fact-based sort of statistical type thing, and uh, it's great for us nuts and bolts spikes. And then for the second part of our main topic, uh, I would like to talk about your latest Ars Arcanum. Is that what you said? Ars Arcanum, yeah. Arcanum, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know how I to don't say know. it. It's a made-up word. Like, Is I, it I, really? I, yeah, exactly. Oh, I, mean, I didn't know. It, come, it comes from Latin, um, and so... But I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't speak Latin. It's not even grammatically correct Latin. It's what does just, it mean? Um, it's like the the magical arts or the secret arts or something like that. Um, okay. So yeah, it's it's bad Latin basically. Bad Latin, and and this yeah. is coming from somebody who's a teacher, so he actually yeah, I know. knows. I've been corrected so many times on that, and people are like, "You know, this is wrong," and I'm like, "Yeah, I know. I can't change it now, so it's stuck." But, yeah, <laughs> nice choice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but anyway, and we'll get a, a look on. Uh, your your column for Cons of Tarkir and to see what you've discovered. Before we do, though, let's crack a pack. Yeah. Now, this one, I was actually supposed to open it when I had Noah Sandler on. Um, this is from Kiora's follower on Twitter, uh, and he says he's the third biggest fan of the show, and um, he wanted me to open it with – with Noah. And so I'm, I'm, I apologize. Uh, I forgot it was in my pile of boosters and I forgot that I had to open one at a specific time. Um, he does have a message here though. I don't know how you're going to feel about this, Matthew. Let's hear it. He says, Elmer can die in a dune blast. Oh. Long live Shelly. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. That, that's interesting. Yeah. What a monster. So, I will say, um, I think that if Kiora's follower had been like the second, you know, biggest fan, that probably you would have remembered to open his back last week. But. <laughs> so it was lack of effort. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right, let's take a look at what we've got. Uh, first card is Sage Eye Harrier. Okay. Yeah. Not not super exciting, right? No, definitely not. I mean, it's it's a card that I like to play. Um, it, you know, I it's like my twentieth most drafted common in the set. But okay, not because so I'm excited to draft it, but just because you end up getting them. Yeah, I'm like, well, I need to have a creature, so I'll just throw this guy in. Sure. So. Um, Weave Fate. We fate. I don't think I've cast one. I have cast one, but I always find that there's better options for card draw in the set. And also, and tell me if you agree with this, I've uh, I've also found that I have so much to do with my mana at all times that like working in a we fate is is very rarely what I want to be doing with my whole turn. Yeah, exactly. Like four four mana is really expensive, especially when you can draw three cards for one mana. Um, you know, I, I play a lot of treasure cruises. I don't play we've paid at all. So yeah. if I want to draw a spell, I can get one and it'll be my one or two treasure cruises in the deck. Yeah, you got the treasure cruises, and then also there's like secret plans. If you're on that, then you're yep. not going to run Weave Fate alongside secret plans. That doesn't make much sense. And or there's the black one, bitter revelation. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Which yeah. is a lot better than Weave Fate. So yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Weave Fate. I'm sorry. Uh, Bloodfire Expert. Bloodfire Expert. Okay. Thoughts. It's- I'm trying to remember. I, I mix up the names of the. Uh, this is the expert. three one. Oh, the three one. Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's uh, you know I actually Bloodfire Expert has been growing on me a lot. I'm not a huge fan of red, but um, it you know it's kind of the color that I avoid the most. But Bloodfire Expert is kind of uh, um, what makes the red green deck work. Um, it's one of those cards along with the the Yeti. Um, just because you can use your Savage Punches and things like that, and it has four power, so uh, it's been growing on me a lot. Yeah, it basically does a good impression of a uh, an alpine grizzly in that deck. Yeah, exactly. A bad alpine grizzly, yeah. Right. Um next is Smite the Monstrous. Okay. It's I yeah, I don't know. I it's okay. People bring it in against me a lot. Um I I don't play him very often, but it's a decent card if you need something to deal with bombs then you know, it's good. Yeah, I I tend to play one of those if I feel like my deck is really well suited to blocking on the ground, yeah. right? If I've got like a yep. bunch of walls or high toughness, low power creatures, maybe some death touchers or whatever, where I just really feel confident that I can gum up the ground every game, I'm a lot more likely to run a Smite the Monstrous in a deck like that just because sometimes they produce something huge that can actually power through the walls or right. you know maybe even something like a uh, River Wheel Aerialists or something like that that you just sort of need to kill. Yeah, and if I don't have very many ways to interact with my opponent's creatures, then I'll, I'll definitely play it because I need to be able to kill something. Um, and it can it can do good in Obzon because you've got a lot of these creatures sitting around, and so you might attack, they might double block, and you can kill something and get some value out of it. But overall, it's it, it rarely makes my main deck. Usually it's in the sideboard and... Um, just because it's so easy to get 22 playables in this format. Yeah, that's what I found too. The one The one spot that I thought early on that Smite would be better at but hasn't proven to be good enough at is uh, blowing out combat tricks. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think I've ever done it. Like maybe well, once. Yeah, I mean, it's the there's the two green combat tricks that you can get, but those ones aren't even that good, and it doesn't work against like feet of resistance. So right, that's the one you're worried about, and it doesn't really do anything against that. I mean, so. it can, but yeah, it rarely does. <laughs> yeah, very rarely. Um, Awaken the bears next. So speaking of one of those two green combat tricks, uh, here's Awaken the bear. Thoughts on Awaken the bear? I like it better than the um, the one that I forget the name. The one that untaps the creature. Oh, um, the yeah, harden uh, not harden scales. Whatever. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I, I like waking one. the bear better. But um, so this one usually like it'll end up as my twenty second card, and the other one will end up as my twenty third card. So, but, oh, but they are making the cut for you m- m- most of the time. Oh well, I don't know that I can say most of the time. It's right on the borderline. You know, it's okay. I. I Never pick them up early because yeah, I know Dragon I'm always going to get one. the other one, by the way. Yeah, so I just let them go. Like I'll just pass them, and I'll usually pick one up uh, 12th, 13th, 14th. And then if I need uh, – you know, if I'm low on removal or just I need a way to punch some creatures through or I have a lot of creatures and not very many spells, then I'll throw it in. Um, or if I've got like the red green deck and some some of the blood fire experts, you know, it can make them bigger uh, like a plus four, plus four. So then I'll run it. But otherwise not. I'm not excited. 
Yeah, I'm so. not either. That, that, that's the kind of card that always is down in on Magic Online, is in my playables until the end, and then it goes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, next is, oh, speak of the devil, Bitter Revelation. Bitter Revelation. Okay. I'm a big fan now. Uh, this card's yeah, actually gone up for me over time. Um, yeah, me too. But at the same time, like, I'm not first picking it. Like, when it when it comes to just pure card draw spells, I feel like if I want one, I can get one, and I usually want one. Like, either zero or one. Yeah, you, usually I'm looking for, like, one bit of revelation. I, I don't mind playing a couple treasure cruises just because it's so powerful. Um, but uh, usually I, if I'm running black green, I'll run a mix of Scout the Borders and Bitter Revelation. And so I want, want like, one of each. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely don't take it very high. But I, I'm happy to play it. I always want one in my in my black decks. Yeah, I like that, too. Uh, Throttle is next. Uh, Throttle is so much better than uh, Lash of the Whip. In this format, you mean? Yeah, it's so much better. Yeah, like, it's way better. I remember just Lash of the Whip. I thought it was going to be good and um, in Theros, and it just kept going down and down and down to where I didn't even play it. But Throttle, you know, it's it's a good card. Um, yeah, it's gone up I, for me, actually. Yeah, exactly. There's there's so many four toughness creatures in the format, So many, uh, and you can kill basically all of the um the multicolored morph creatures yeah um so that's kind of where where it goes and i mean you off, you can often just kill any creature right it, as long yeah, as exactly. combat's involved yeah at the same time i do just want one of those morph creatures rather than throttle so i don't take it that highly True. um uh, and i don't want more than just a couple just because it's too expensive but it, i i do like it a lot and yeah i, I thought it was going to be bad after you know me after too last, so that's funny i thought the same thing um Next is Scout the Borders. I love Scout the Borders. Are you um, a big fan of it? I am a big fan of it. It's like it's like green draw card produce two mana. It's so you're playing like mana morphos. It's one of my favorite cards in the set. I, I don't want to play a lot of them. I only want one. Um but <laughs> but I, I love it. I love to have it in my decks. It you know, it kind of fixes mana. It it lets you it lets you play the treasure cruises. Treasure cruises is one of my you know you've heard that a lot from me, but love treasure cruises, hooting mandrels, and um, uh, I want to play those cards um, on turn four when you can go scout the borders into Ho hooting mandrels. It's just like uh, completely busted. Yeah, that does so, feel like a pretty ridiculous turn. Yeah, it's just you can't take it high because you're get, you're gonna get one if you're in green. You're gonna get one. So, but I do like to play it. By the way, I think this is really funny. So you you called it you you made it akin to like mana morphos or what did you say draw a card yeah draw a card give you two mana two mana right now yeah. the the funny part is this is like where do you fall on the hyperbole scale <laughs> because BDM said he thinks it's dark ritual plus <laughs> uh, <laughs> plus um, demonic tutor <laughs> okay that's. That's, I mean, that's obviously, he was taking some liberties, <laughs> right? Like, he doesn't actually think that. But, you know, he's saying, like, look, this card, you know, it does two, like, really powerful things. And uh, I do think it's Definitely. funny, though, like, how do you... <laughs> I should say, this is the kind of card that I typically hate in Limited. Like, I don't play these kind of cards. I, mm -hmm. uh, so, the fact that I like it is just a testament to, you know, how... Five cards is a lot. It can find lands or creatures. You're always going to find something, and the mana is really useful, so... Yeah, it's pretty decent. I, I, I find that Scout the Borders ends up being in that same category for me as Awaken the Bear, where I'm just like, oh, I could I could run it. Like, I'm not unhappy to run it, but then I end up not. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I have it, like, basically one card slot higher, I guess. Yeah. Uh, next is Mardu Banner. You a Banner guy? <laughs> I don't play them ever. I don't either. So. Um, I, I get them I get them 14th, and I'm like, eh, I guess. So. Yeah. Um, all right. Now, here's a good one. I'm really glad we got this card. This is important. So you just said you really like Tooting Mandrills. I'm assuming you also like uh, Sultai uh, Scavenger. Yeah, yeah. What about Shambling Attendants? Shambling Attendants. Yeah, um, so that's the one that we got here. Remember, eight mana instead of the six for those other two. But yeah. it's pretty nice at three, five Death Touch. Like, There's not a lot that deals with this card in the format. Once you get it on the board, it's like it dominates the board. There, there's few common creatures that, that – um, that just outclass it. it. Even the good, like the good morph creatures, they just trade for it. And so it's really strong. It's just eight mana is a lot. It's so much. Like I actually yeah. thought that it would be comparable, uh, to like Hootie Mandrels and the scavenger. When I first saw it, I thought, well, sure. It's, you're not going to get it quite as soon, but you're getting a better card, you know? So I thought it makes sense, right? Like it's just, it costs right. a couple more mana. But what I found is the gap, between six and eight, 
even when you're considering delve is still very very big yeah the the biggest problem with the delve cards is that they're they're so bad in the early game um and if you have a hooting mandrels when you get to six mana if you haven't put anything in the yard at least you can cast it so yeah shambling attendance you're never going to cast it unless you get some stuff in the yard right. it's, it, it's very rare rare that you do and if if you do get to the point where you're at eight mana and you have nothing in the yard i don't know how you're losing that game in the first place right so yeah good point <laughs> it's, it, so that's kind of my problem with it um the other cards i can cast like soul tie scavenger if i'm casting out on six mana a lot of times it's still really relevant because it's still attacking. Uh, you know, uh, that means that the board is probably slowed down, um, stalled out, and then that can get through. Or Hooting Mandrels, it, if it's at the top of my curve of a bunch of creatures, then I'm still happy to play it. But Shanley Tense, I don't mind running like one of if I if I don't have very many other Delve cards. But it's I I love when I cast the card. It's not something that I actively seek out though. That's interesting. Yeah, and and I guess if. If you're the guy who loves scout the borders is saying that, then uh, it probably yeah, doesn't exactly. bode well for somebody like me who who generally doesn't run it. So yeah, I mean, you do get these situations where you have like one or two dove cards in your deck, and then I'm happy to run it. It's just you know I'll throw it in, but it's, I, I want to prioritize the other ones that are better. Yeah. All right, uncommon time. Awesome. Holy smokes, we got some doozies here, kiddo. Uh, Winter flame. Winter flame. I like that card. Big fan of winter flame or medium yeah. fan? What do you think? I would say medium, medium fan of it. Like I can see first picking it, but uh, I think there's a lot of cards that are, that are better. Um, it's, it compares very favorably to morphs. So that's really good, but I don't like going into two colors if I can help it in my first pick. Um, and it, the problem with it is that it is two colors, but a lot of times it's not quite high enough impact when you're casting it, you know, when you're already in blue, red and you're casting it, it's one of the best things you can do, um, you know, in the mid, in the mid game. But the problem is that like, if you're taking a multicolored card like this at the very beginning, you want it to have a high impact if you need to splash it. And it's just not quite there. Right. Yeah. That's the thing is that it, cause it, it's very, it's, it's very time specific, this card, right? Like right. it wants to be cast on a very certain turn. If you're casting it, it's usually four or five. By turn five. Yeah. Then it's excellent. One of the best cards in your deck. If you're casting it on turn 10, sometimes it's excellent. Sometimes it just doesn't really do that much. Yeah. So. What I found is that, uh, that, um, Jess guy can really take full advantage of winter flame because you'll yep. get a prowess trigger or two. You'll actually kill a creature. And just as importantly, you're going to push through a whole bunch of damage because you're going to get to tap something else down. I mean, oftentimes this thing just says they don't get to block at all this turn. And then, yeah. I mean, and, and it's man down. So I live in fear of Jess guy casting winter flame. It's just like, yeah. well, if they have winter flame, I lose, you know, that's eight damage coming across and I can't stop it. So. Right. Yeah. I've seen it in teamer, but it's less impressive in teamer though. Still yeah. obviously like you're never cutting it from a team. Yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm much more of a teamer player than I am a, a Jess guy player. And so okay. that's probably why, um, why I value it a little bit lower, but still a very good card. I'd be, I'd be happy to fit first pick it so far out of this pack. All right. So. Um, what about set adrift? This is uh, this is another delve card, and from clearly you're a fan of delve. Uh, does set adrift make the cut for you? And and if so, how good is it? Uh, I would take winter flame over it. So okay, you it's, you'd be willing to take on a full another color. Yeah, yeah. It's my problem with set adrift. It's it's just the same thing. You only want so many delve cards. So uh, I I like delve a lot. It's a really powerful mechanic. I like powering it up, but I only want to take the best delve cards because you can still only when even when you're like playing the scout the borders and things, you can't have more than like four delve cards. So it, set adrift just isn't powerful enough. Uh, with that said, uh, I've I have played it. Um, it. It's a card that I'll bring out of the board a lot against the the people that are playing like the the snake skin and things like that. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> and when you just get them Dragon with grip. set of drift and you're like yeah take that so i know you get the one for one it's just effectively a two for one after you yeah. break their draw step yeah that's pretty nice i'd put it about on the same level as like throttle though that's about where i would play it um maybe a teensy bit lower yeah i put it significant like i put it a full step below throttle for me sure like, that makes sense yeah i rarely actually play set of drift and i'll almost never not play a throttle in a black deck yeah that makes sense um, it's probably in the same range for me yeah so our next uncommon, by the way, this pack was really stinky until we got to the uncommons, uh, Obzon Charm. <laughs> I love Obzon Charm. Me I too. <laughs> in here. Like one of my favorite cards in the set. It's um, so, so good. Now you, you have to tell me if this is true for you, but I find myself casting the counters option more than anything else. No. Like 80% of the time. Definitely not for me. Yeah. No, I'm all about removing a creature. 
Yeah, but see, you're doing the five color thing, and you're like, uh, you got you to gotta kill the stuff. <laughs> and I'm, I'm running like the, these Obzon decks and like the Sultai decks splashing white, and I'm like, attack with my 3 3, and they're like, okay, I'll block with my 3 3, and I'm like, ah, gotcha. It's, it, so, is, it is excellent when you do that, because then yeah. you get to effectively remove a creature anyway. Exactly. So, so I, I, keep, I keep using it like, I could kill your creature, or I could just attack and kill your creature and get the counters. And so it, I found that about 80% of the time I'm casting plus one, plus one counters. And then I use the, the removal option as like emergency, you know, like I'm going to die. Got to kill that thing. So um, what about drawing cards? Yeah, I've, I mean, I love that. I love having that option. It's just the other two are so powerful that a lot of times they don't use it. But if my opponent's not doing anything, I'll just get a few more cards so that I can just keep throwing stuff down on the board. See, it's weird because I never know what I'm supposed to do with that part. Yeah. I always feel like uh, like I've got the best removal spell in my whole deck in my hand right now. And exactly. let's say I'm at parity. Yeah. Like, I feel like it's just greedy to just draw the cards and just to try to hit random. Like, what am I really trying to hit, right? Like, I guess a better threat, maybe? But, like, uh, yeah. uh, man, I've got the best card in my deck already in my hand. Like, how am I going to cash it in? So I, I never I, – I very rarely do. The times when I have, um, when I thought it made sense, was when I was I was in a five-color deck and I had two copies of uh, Secret Plans down. Okay, yeah. And I thought and I you know, I had tons of morphs in the deck and, and I thought, well look, if I if I obs on charm into a morph here, like now we're in business. Right. Now right. I flip it up, I draw two more cards after that, and then I mean, how do I lose from there? Because you know how when you get the second secret plants, it just starts feeding into more morphs, like it just it right. kind of spirals out of control. So that time I did fire it off and feel quite safe about it. And I've done it a couple of other times. Um when my opponent was top decking and when I had some amount of pressure, but not enough to get through what he had. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll draw, you know, like I can close the door on this game here if I draw some cards where if, if I just hold it in my hand, my opponent could, could draw something I could kill with Obs on Charm, but they could also just draw something that I can't. And then I'm just sitting there letting them catch up. So I decided to, to fire it off in those situations and it's been great. But yeah, for yeah, me, that- it's like 80% kill, kill your creature. Yeah, and that makes sense. Like it's, I, I very very rarely dr- use it to draw cards as well. But uh, the times when I've done it is also when they've missed land drops for like two turns in a row, and I just want to keep adding stuff to the board and attacking. And what so, does the world come to? Yeah, we don't <laughs> like we. The third option for both of us is drawing cards. I mean, have you yeah, ever exactly. drawn a card before? <laughs> like. It's uh, I kind mean, of awesome. But removing creatures is really good, and I mean, That's travel true. preps. I love travel preps. So. All right, rare time. Awesome. Got a good one. Yeah, it's a pretty good one. Mantis Rider. Mantis Rider. Ooh. Bang. Take wow, three. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So the cards I have pulled out here, and, and if you want to change any of them, you can let me know. I have Winter Flame, uh, Bitter Revelation, Throttle, Obzon Charm, and Mantis Rider. Those are the ones that stood out to me as cards I would consider. Um, the other cards that are left, uh, you know, there's the Set Adrift, Attendance, Scout, like. There's just really nothing that we, that I'd ever consider picking. Um, of the two black cards, which one do you like, Bitter Revelation or Throttle? Uh, probably uh, pack one, pick one. I'd take the Throttle because it, uh, that's the kind of card that I'm more willing to play multiples of. Um, uh, so, All right. yeah, between those two cards, I'd probably take the Throttle, but I think it's pretty close. I think so too, but I, I agree with you. I think Throttle's better. Um, so that leaves one lone champion for the one color pick. And then we've got Winter Flame, which is a two-color card, and then Obs on Charm and Mantis Rider, which, of course, are full-on three-color cards. So right. I'm, I'm curious, how does Matthew Watkins break this situation down? How, how much do you want to be you know, not taking a three-color card? Because clearly, like, Obs on Charm and Mantis Rider are the two best cards here, right? Yeah, they're easily the two best cards and about on the same power level. Like you can make an yeah. argument for for each of those cards being stronger. Winter Flame is uh, definitely a lot worse, like uh, a lot less strong, but it's it's less colors. It's two colors, and it leaves you with the possibility of going into two different guild uh, clans. Yeah, exactly. Which so, is, I mean, how much you know? Like now, the questions start becoming like, well, how important is that to you, right? Right, yeah. If I if I were opening up this pack, I I would kind of groan to myself a little bit, like, uh, I don't know what's coming down the pike. I'm probably gonna have to, you know, there's around like a fifty percent chance I'm just gonna have to cut this card anyway. Um, if I'm taking the Obson Charm or the Mantis Rider. With that said, uh, Winter Flame is still two colors, 
Yeah. Um, and so it's it's jumping from that second color to the third color, like it cuts you off from a lot of decks, but um, it, it's not the same as the jump from one color to two colors, if that makes sense. Oh, totally. Yeah. And so I mean, basically from one color, you can go into, you know, any number of decks, how, however many. And then in two colors, you're down to two. Right, exactly. And in three colors, you're down to one. Yeah, so if this was like Murderous Cut was the Winter Flame, then I would just slam the Murderous Cut and it wouldn't be close. Me too. Um, but I think it comes down to the Obson Charm or the Mantis Rider. And I, I prefer Obson by like a lot over over Jeskai. So I'd probably take the Obson Charm. But I can respect taking the Mantis Rider because it's a very powerful card. You know the scary part yeah. about this pack? There's no land in it. Oh, geez. Yeah, that's like, true. Like we're not wheeling oh. a duel here ever. <laughs> Nope. So I got to start planning ahead right now. Yeah, that's good to know. So you're, but so, you're on OBS on Charm overall. Yeah, I would take OBS on Charm. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. That that's the same pick I would make too. Yeah, uh, I think OBS on is the <clears throat> most powerful, uh, most consistent guild, uh, clan. I keep saying guild. I don't know why. Uh, clan in, in and of itself. Yeah. Um, I also think it's the most popular though. Like I feel like that's the one that yep. gets snatched up the most. But yeah, whatever. That, that, that's exactly the problem here is Obzon is so so heavily drafted and taking taking a, a card that's straight Obzon is really difficult off the off the top. And at the same time, I don't like to be in Jeskai very much. It's it doesn't fit my style all that well. Um and it's I don't know, like a really good Obzon deck just crushes everything. You know, you just never lose because you just win on turn six and it's over. But a bad uh, a bad Jeskai deck just falls apart and it's really difficult to beat to beat like an obs on deck exactly so. yeah i've talked about it since actually the very beginning of the format which was uh when the first time that i drafted it uh, i felt as if the deck was very very fragile yep and yeah. uh and i've and i didn't know if that was going to be the case because i had only drafted it once so who knows maybe just the deck i had was fragile but it's actually borne out to be true uh for the long term which is that I mean, they kill your, your wind scout and you're looking at your hand of like force away, crippling chill, you know, you're just not doing anything now. And, yep. uh, and that's like the good version of the deck is that right. The one yeah, with all I, the force aways and crippling chills and stuff like that. Exactly. I, I will say like, uh, Jessica is one of the decks that I don't want to face. Um, I look at it and I'm just like, uh, like I might just lose here and it's not in my, it's not in my hands. Me like too. I can't control it. And so I, I don't like to face it, but I don't play it either because, it's not – when I play Jeskai, I feel the same way. Like every single game is not in my hands either. It's just like, well, we'll see what comes off the top. So. Right. And if and, – and, and the games you win are huge, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you just, crush, just them. crush them. And then yeah. the games you lose, you're kind of – they had it and then you never really got to play. And I think yeah. that that appeals to a certain type of player. Yeah. Um, but not to me and apparently not to you either. Yep. Okay. So. All right. So why don't we move on to our uh, to our main topic here. Um, I want to talk about your column. So yep. before we dive into what you've discovered about uh, cons of Tarkir specifically, uh, I want you to let us know about, I mean, you know, what was the impetus for starting the column and what were your goals for it and, and what are they now? And uh, and again, start to talk us through like um, the methods that you use uh, to get to where you get in the column. Excellent. So where I started off from, uh, this was in 2009. Um my wife had just uh, – she was going to do student teaching and so we moved down to Las Vegas. And uh, the Las Vegas area in 2009 was not known for its you know, a rapid economic growth or anything like it that. It was bombing out there. It, it was terrible. I went six months without finding a job. Um, so And I, I applied to everywhere. I mean I looked at about 50 different places trying to find jobs. Couldn't find anything six months because everything was just – there, there was no jobs. And so I was in this difficult dilemma where I'm like, I want to play magic, but I have no money. That so, is a dilemma. Exactly. So I was like, how, how am I going to do this? So I started writing for Pure MTGO. It was purely mercenary. I'm like, you know what? I got to start writing articles so that I can afford to, to draft as much as I want. So I, I started just kind of thinking of what I wanted to do. I started off writing these like general strategy articles, which I loved and which just were not, you know, <laughs> people didn't read them. Um, and then uh, I just kind of accidentally hit on this thing with the, with um, kind of doing this statistics based column. Um, I was already doing a lot of like number crunching just, just for myself. Cause I like to do that as um, um, I'm kind of a spreadsheet nerd. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was just already doing this stuff, and um, I sat down, and I was like uh, – I was kind of protesting the pre-release events when they were kind of expensive. 
I was oh, like, right, oh, when, they, when they changed the pricing on them. Yeah, exactly. And they're expensive. And I'm like, I'm going to pro- protest this and I'm not going to watch. I'm not going to play. I'm just going to watch as many games as possible. Just like write down all the data. And then I, and then I looked at it and I'm like, you know what? Somebody's going to want to read this. So I just put it together, um, you know, in, into an article and put it out there. And uh, the response was just very positive about it. So um, the what I was thinking when I sat down to write it is I was uh, one of the things that I noticed is. Uh, in the magic community, you have kind of have this divide between like the haves and the have nots, the people that uh, have like teams that can test together and get a lot of reps in with um, with limited. And then you have the people that don't and maybe draft once a week and they just they don't have the same information as as the other people do. You know, they, right. you, you just can't get the same thing because you're you're not playing as much. And so what I wanted to do is kind of replicate that a little bit, what the, what the teams were doing replicated in, in, in a way that was consumable by like your, your nuts and bolts spike. That's wanting to, um, but, but that only kind of plays, uh, irregularly or, uh, drafts, you know, once or twice a week, something like that. Yeah. Um, a lot of our listenership I'm sure is made up of people that fit that demographic. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I was kind of aiming for. And the goal was to kind of bring what you have on a team to to those players um, in a way, which I don't know how successful that is. But I do think that it, it's it's really useful for uh, for that demographic to, to get this kind of data and see um, just see what's actually happening um, instead of just going based on based on their own experiences, which tend to be relatively low samples. So. OK, so what do you actually do? So what I do is. Uh, um, the the format will come out and I will sit down on my computer and I'll open up to uh, I'll open up MTGO and I'll open up the replays like uh, two sets of games and I'll just put them up on my screen and uh, these are the replays for uh, just drafts that people are doing so you can go in and you can open up anybody's tournament that's already finished and you can just watch the watch the games. So I'll open that up and I just have two games going on my monitor um, and I just sit and watch them and I jot down uh, different data points about them like um, what what turn the game ends on, what colors they're playing and different kinds of information depending on what I'm looking at um, that time. And I'll do that for about 15 hours um, all together over just a weekend. Just grind it out? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so you're essentially is- just sitting there watching other yeah. people play. And then yeah. taking notes that are going to be data points that you're going to then combine all together to spit out some, you know, calling them conclusions might be strong, but some some data, some information. Yeah, exactly. yeah. that's insane. Yeah, I know it's it's insane. I don't know how I ever got myself roped into this. It's so much work. So, <laughs> it's, <laughs> but I mean, I love to have the data, and so and and people like the articles, and so I keep doing it. Like it's out of the love for it, but yeah. Now, it, so so your thinking fun. though is. You know, most of the time uh, when you get people's opinions, it's based on anecdotal evidence, right? right exactly. Like if I have a pro even come on the podcast and tell me what they think about the format, they'll be like, oh, Blue Green's definitely the best deck and right. blah, blah, blah is the best deck. And the question though is, well, what are you actually basing that on, right? Yeah, and, exactly. and we don't That question doesn't normally get asked of, of the pros. It's just sort of like, well, they've drafted so they know. Um, and what they're really basing it on though is a relatively small sample size of drafts that they've done. Uh, and, and this doesn't, I shouldn't say pro, this is just anybody, right? I mean, the yep, guy at your exactly. local shop, uh, the person who's on Twitter pontificating or whatever, uh, um, a lot of times, uh, us on this show, you know, we're, we're telling you what our opinions are currently, but you know, we're basing it again off of what's ultimately a fairly small sample size. And on top of it, um, we're not really tracking it. Yeah, exactly. You know, it- and you're, you're attempting to kind of cut through that, right? Exactly. It's, it's people use a lot of, which is not bad. I think the thing, I think that what people use is they'll do a mixture of experience and theory, um, trying mm-hmm. to figure out what's best, which is very useful. Your experience, you learn a lot more from your experience than you can learn from, uh, from just reading a statistical article because you're actually in it and you're actually seeing all the different, uh, all the different things that are happening in that moment. And so it's a very, uh, you would call it a very rich, uh, um, uh, uh, a very rich experience. You can learn a lot from it. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is that it is a small sample size, so you don't know um, how reflective of that that is of what's happening overall. Um, and then theory, like theory, could be wrong. Um, so you you do a mixture of that, and a lot of times you can kind of get close to 
close to where things actual actually are. But um, I think that it's important to mix in data with those two things, uh, you know, taking hard data and keeping track of results and um, just seeing the numbers on things just to, just to verify that what you're looking at, your experiences and your theory are actually what's happening. So one of the things we like to talk about on the show is you're aware are sort of the mental traps that people can fall for, right? Right. Best case scenario mentality, uh, being yep. results oriented. Um, and these are huge, huge traps when you're trying to make sweeping conclusions about formats based on relatively small sample sizes and with really imperfect conditions, right? I mean, right. You, know, uh, you know, take like a really good magic player and they go to their local FNM. And they draft the same deck three weeks in a row and just trash everybody with it. You know, there's a decent chance that they're just a lot better at playing the games of magic than their opponents are. Exactly. And even exactly. though they think, well, this deck is the the second coming or something, it might not be, right? And if you were yeah. to put it up against, uh, you know, better players, maybe it wouldn't or things would have gone differently in the draft. Um, so there's that's pretty tough. But what I also will say is that when we start going down that path, we start to get back to like – the Ryan Spain days of the show and the time traveling supercomputer, right? Right. There yeah. is an answer, right? It does yeah. exist what the optimal pick is in every scenario, blah, blah, blah. The problem is we just can't know it. Uh, it's, it's impossible for us to actually have enough computing power at this point in human history to be able to simulate all of the things that would need to happen so that we can, you know, spit out a number that, that says, yes, this is the one you should go for. Um, so instead, we have to rely on the things that you mentioned, like our intuition, our experience, our theories. And uh, and I mean, oftentimes, we don't need the tra time traveling supercomputer to tell us things like we, you know, we will as a group uh, have done enough drafts where, let's say, if you agree with something, and I agree with it, and then we look around to the other people that draft a lot, you know, and, and we start going down the line, and, and it's a consensus that everybody agrees. I'm just going to say, you know what, I don't need the time traveling supercomputer to tell me that this is correct, right? So, yeah. you know, yeah. there's a balance to be had. But I like what you've done here. You've you decided to say, well, all right, you know, this isn't perfect, but I'm going to push hard in the direction of actually having data in front of me that I can dissect. And yeah, I think exactly. that's pretty sweet. Yeah, it, it um, it's very helpful. I, I find that um, these these things help me more than they help anybody else because it's very different that I sit down and watch, you know, um, about a thousand matches versus I talk about what I learned watching a thousand matches. So it's something that I learn a lot from, um, and it's it's nice to have just that hard data that you, you can look at and you can say, okay, this is what the numbers are telling me. So so how does that verify what I'm saying? And you, you have something that's a, a teensy bit more certain. Um, with that said, I, I do want to say um, my biggest worry whenever people come to my articles is that they'll put too much stock in them. Um, it's People have to know that statistics are just um, – they're really overrated. Um, w one of the biggest problems that I see when people come and look at my articles is just they, they just take them as fact. They're like, okay, yep, I'll just do that. And that's not how it works. It's um, – Right. Yeah, it's – it's a lot weaker than that. Um, it's there's so many games that get played on Magic, and it's such a complex game that uh, just one sample, even even if it's, I mean, the sample that I, that I'm doing is not a it's not a huge sample. It's a relatively small sample. Um, you know, I'm doing my the best that I can with the time that I have to to get together the data, but there's just no way that I can look at a big enough data set with enough accuracy to to actually say what the format what's best in the format. All I can say is the the way that I look at the articles is that during this given time period, you know, over the course of two or three days, this is what was performing well and this is why I think it's happening. Um, but by the time I do do the articles, by the time I write it up, the data is already old. It's already, um, you know, it's out of date and you have to start building everything uh, not from square one, but pretty close. So. Right. And, you know, and of course – the other thing to consider, I think, uh, you know, just as a caveat is that w the most beautiful thing about draft is the fact that it's relatively fluid, right? Yep. So that expands on both the micro and the macro level. So uh, at the at the micro level, so even if we have – let's say your data was perfect. It's not relevant necessarily to the draft that you're about to sit down for. Exactly. E even if it was perfect, it still would not be – it's still – as soon as you open that first pack, it's – you know, it's basically gone. Right. And then there's also the macro side, which I mentioned, which is 
when enough people look at, say, the data that you put out or maybe their own data and there's conclusions that people come to, well, if they all sit down and take the same exact route, then all of a sudden th the actual data is different now because if everybody's trying to do the same thing, then you're highly benefited to do something else, right? So exactly. if the data says, well, this is the best deck and everybody decides that that's true, then by the nature of how draft works, that is no longer the best deck, which is exactly. fantastic, exactly. right? I mean, I think yeah. that's just great. But so, so what can people look to though for, for your data? Like, I mean, you said you viewed it kind of like as a snapshot. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's like a very high close up snapshot of a small area, I would say. Um, okay. So it's, what I, what I tend to see it as um, being useful for is getting uh, finding out, figuring out the the underlying principles of the format, uh, and I think that's the biggest thing is you know how fast is the format and what what are the biggest factors in what's making people win or lose in the format regardless of the deck that they're in. Um, and okay, so you're trying to go even bigger picture than than specific decks. Yeah, exactly. That, that's kind of the goal is seeing like what, what are the most important things that are happening? What, what kind of cards matter the most in the format? And that's that's the biggest thing that you can take away from it. Um, so the other things that you can you can do is you it, it does help kind of give you an idea of uh, what other people are thinking about the format, um, which then you can respond to um, at, at the same time. Like you said, that changes over time. Um but but since I'm looking at what's popular, what's winning, uh, it's kind of seeing how people are uh, taking the questions that the format uh, that produces and what kind of the solutions they're coming up with. And once you can see how people are responding to it um, in in kind of this uh, um, broad st statistical way, you can you can kind of start to see what works and what things need to be changed. So, for example, if you see a deck that's performing well, that doesn't mean that it's like a terrible deck. Uh, what it typically means is that people just aren't drafting it correctly. Um, and so things need to change in it in, in order to make it work, in order to make it um, compete with the other decks. So, Yeah, and you know, one thing that I've seen along those lines is I've seen – well, I've seen decks that just are terrible, right? I mean sometimes they oh, just yeah, are definitely. really bad. Yeah. But, but also I've seen where – it needs to be viewed as bad enough so that you are consistently the only person getting the deck at the table right. and then all of a sudden it becomes quite a bit better because, I mean, there's rarely been a, a space where if – like let's say a two-color pair in in a draft set where if you were literally the only person going after those two colors where you wouldn't just have you know a great deck. I mean there's – I haven't seen a, a, a format that out of whack since I came back. Um Yeah. I mean, I've seen a color, like I've seen individual colors, you know, be pushed down that hard member in M14, how bad white was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. People were passing. <laughs> just avoid it. And you just avoided it, right? But at some point, yeah. if you're the only person playing white, you can pair it up with something and make it work, right? Yeah, and, I, I mean, usually at that point, that's me when I'm like, oh, this nobody's drafting this deck. I'm going to jump in this hole and try to try to work the metagame um, by, by figuring out this deck. So I remember you did that with uh, Demir. Yeah, with Demir and Gate Crash. That was kind I mean, of your big thing. Yeah, it's it, that's still like my most read article was the Gate Crash article. Um, so a little bit of background on that, like basically everyone thought that Demir was unplayable, um, uh, and people would just completely avoid it, just leave it completely open. And so um, I was uh, drafting with uh, Zach Ortz, Um and we we a lot of times we'll like Skype draft together, and we started noticing that like Dinrova horrors were going around. And oh, that um, thing was my boy. Yeah, so I'd see Dinner Over Horror and I'm like, that card's just too good. I'm just gonna start taking it. So we just start taking the Dinner Over Horrors and like the Grizzly Spectacles and things like that. And we just noticed that we kept winning. And it was like it just kept winning over and over and over again. We were taking just getting like four Grizzly Spectacles in a deck. Um, things like that. Wow. And yeah, exactly. And so it's like, well, I guess if people are just not gonna draft this, so I'll, I'll just force it. So I started forcing it and I drafted it. I won thirteen drafts in a row with it. Um, that is unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. It was it was just uh, the most absurd run that I've ever had in Magic. Um, and it was just like in between those thirteen drafts, I think at some point, like after draft eleven, I drafted like um, like a Boros deck, and then I immediately went like uh, like zero and one or something. I was like, no, nope, back on the Demir train. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was. It was a lot of fun, but um, it, it was precisely that kind of thing. People were just avoiding it so much. Um, I think it was still strong enough that if there was another person in it, like 
I was willing to fight a little bit for it, but um, because it was so underdrafted, you just got absurd decks. Right, so. and so that's the kind of thing that people can look for, at least uh, on a temporary basis on the column. Uh, what other things should people – like I'm curious to hear what should people expect to get out of the column and what should they not expect to get out of the column? So uh, one of the things that uh, one of my goals is I like to provide kind of a jumping off point for discussions. So it's a really play, good place to go and kind of see what people are doing um, and confirm what you're what you're seeing. Um, but you're you're not going to get uh, like I, I do expect people to be able to look at it and get a little bit of a bump in win rate by figuring out you know this is how I should be doing this this draft. And so um, every article I try to outline kind of a specific deck and say, okay, this is one of the decks that I was see seeing works really well. And this is what I saw is working in that particular deck. And so uh, I do pr try to provide those kind of keys. Um, I, I always do like a, um, like a recommendations at the end of it, um, which is the things that I think you can learn from the data. Um, so things like, uh, for example, I said in, uh, cons of Tarker that the format's kind of slow. Um, that the board stall out a lot, that you should play 18 lands. Um, whoa, whoa, spoiler alert. We're going to get to that. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, jumping ahead a little bit. But yeah. these are the kind of things that I'm saying you can find out from this from the data. Okay. But you, the things that you can't find out is what deck I should play. You can't find out things like, oh, what common should I be drafting? Or what are the best cards in the format? That's just impossible. I can't see it. Um, like I can't see when, when I'm doing the, the data collection, I can't see what people are drafting. Um, I can't see what people have in their hands. I can't see what people are playing in their deck list. And so all of that is completely invisible to me. Um, all, all I can see is what actually makes it onto the table and who knows, like you, somebody might, might not, j might just not draw their good cards. Um, they might have all of one color in their hand and not of another color or something like that. And so uh, those kind of things, card specific things, uh, I almost never can really tell you un unless the card stands out just far and away above everything else. So, okay. So that's good. I think that's uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a reasonable thing. And I also think that it's, it, it really, really hits uh, listeners of this show hard because when I think about drafters, I usually think of, there's a couple of different groups. Um, one of them are people that are probably listening to this show and who are, you know, they're looking to get good, uh, it limited, but they also have a deep understanding of the fact that that draft is great for the reasons that you said that you can't tell people that this is just what you do. That things like bread just don't get you to being a good drafter. That yep. you know this is why we don't play constructed. I mean, look, I'm not saying you can't play constructed, but this is why limited's better than constructed, right? Yeah, definitely. Which it's is that on constructed, you absolutely can just go download the best deck in the format and get the list. Now, yeah. that does not mean you're going to win with it. Uh, being good at playing a deck and sideboarding and stuff is a whole nother league above, uh, you know, above. But at the same time, when it comes to limited, you can't do either. Like, yeah, there it, is no formula. And you, you're not going to find it in, in Matthew's column or anywhere else on this show or, or anywhere. You have to have a large volume of knowledge, experience, tools, and then you can start to piece it together yourself. But that's the only thing worth doing anyway, right? I mean, that's when it yeah, feels exactly. awesome. It's not because I figured out to download somebody's deck list that won the Pro Tour. Like, that's not hard. You know, that's not rewarding in any way, right? I mean, putting yeah. the time to get really good with a deck like that is. And, and for limited, you need constructed. to have both. That's the thing with constructed is like – you download the deck from the Pro, Pro Tour and you've got like a certain amount of win percentage that you're just naturally going to get mm -hmm. uh, because it's just a good deck. And then you're you're picking up, you know, 10 to 15 points from the experience. In Limited, you've got like 10% that you're naturally going to win just from going into the format. And then you can pick up the other, you know, 60% from your experience. Um, so that's that's kind of the difference between the two formats, I think. Right. So, all right. Why don't we, uh, why don't we now use this as an example? Uh, and I want to use your your latest uh, column cool. on yeah. cons. So let's let's go through. I've got the column up in front of me, and okay. we can kind of go through some of the the hallmarks of your column, and then we'll we'll even get to some of the conclusions and ideas that you had based on your data for this exact thing, just as a sort of a you know show topic. But cool. you know, one of the first things that you bring up as a graphic. Um, and again, the the link for this column is in the show notes. So that if you'd like to follow along on your computer, you can go ahead and click on it there, um, is speed. You talk about speed of the format um, in each of your columns, and it seems to be something that you really try to dial into. 
Yeah, it's a, when I was first writing the columns, it was hard to figure out like what pre, what data points were the most important ones, the most predictive of like what uh, of the principles of the format and what uh, what decks were going to be good. But speed is one that I've come on like every single time. It's one of the most important factors in the entire thing. Um, I, I would even go so far as to say is the the most important thing to understand about the format. First of all, is how fast the format it is. Uh, once you understand that. Just kind of everything else builds on top of that. Yeah. So, like, what are the like one thing that I think of when I think of a of, of a fast format, right? Is something like um, how many two drops I need to play, right? Um, what what the removal should look like, right? Like, how am I punished for playing throttle, for example, a five mana removal spell that's often removing something that doesn't cost five mana, uh, versus you know a slower format where I actually have some time to get to throttle mana and not be under like extreme pressure. Um, yeah. What, are those the kind of things that you're looking for with, with the speed of the format? Yeah. So um, one example is during Theros, I would just avoid five drops and six drops at, at basically all costs. And I play like two or three in any deck um, because the format was just fast enough that I, and you had all those bestow creatures, so you had all this stuff to do with your mana anyway. So I just I never had time to cast those things, and you'd typically have cards in your hand at the end of the game, um, and so you know that it, it's not going to come down quite as much to to card advantage. It's going to come down a little bit more to tempo, getting your things out of uh, your opponent's things out of the way. You know that if you bounce something, that it's uh, well, it's not good, as good as killing it. That it's still very important because they're not just going to be able to deploy all their threats again. Uh, so, uh, f- I think a lot of times what people think when, uh, when I talk about the speed of the format is like, can I play seven drops? Um, can I play six and seven drops? And that's part of it, but it also is like, what kinds of cards are good? So for example, in cons of Tarkir, Archer's Parapet is one of my favorite cards. I love that um, card. Yeah. I love Archer's Parapet. And like, I think it's the best green two drop, uh, common two, two drop, um, over like the, um, Elmer and uh, the uh, Smoke Teller. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd rather have the Archer's Parapet if you know if I'm anywhere near black because it stalls the early game and then in the late game you just keep using it and you'll deal like ten points of damage and win the game because the the game will uh, kind of freeze up in in that slot. Um, a, a lot of people really love Mystic of the Hidden Way and I'm a little bit lower than uh, they are on it, but it's still a very good card in this format because. The board gets stalled, and so if you can flip up this guy and attack three or four times, then you're going to win. Um, uh, a card's like Treasure Cruise. If you know that you're going to have a couple extra turns, then you know that you can cast it. You know that you're going to be able to draw those cards and cast those cards, and so it's a little bit better. So uh, those are the kinds of things I'm looking at. Um, the, the kinds of things that you can find out from the speed of the format. Like you said, removal, you know... It, Another reason why uh, Throttle is so much better in uh, in this format than Lash of the Whip was is because it's a little bit slower, so you're killing things that cost five mana versus things that cost two mana. So, so, so what did you actually find out about Cons of Tarkir as far as speed went? I see. Well, actually, it says Magic 2015, but I'm pretty sure that it means. Oh Cons goodness, there. yeah, yeah, that's a typo. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of typos in these because I, you know, <laughs> it's a lot of work over a very short period of time. But in any case, so this is Cons of Tarkir. Um, so the format is basically uh, I have I've kept track of like every format that I've done over the past few years um like all the turns and so I keep this database that's like an average of what all the formats look like uh, and so a typical magic game in in all these formats that I've looked at is that the game ends between s- turn 7 and 8 uh you know okay. um around 40% of the time um and then it'll end so then you can kind of expand the umbrella to like turn seven and nine, and that's where about 60% of games will end in most formats. Um, so cons of Tarkir is you basically take that that number and you shift it over two turns. Uh, to oh, where wow. Yeah, so uh, you still have kind of close to the same number of like sixes, and you still have a bunch of sevens, but the bulk of the turns are taking place around turns like eight, nine, ten, and eleven. Um, and even up to 12 and 13 is where you have like the bulk around 70% of the games are ending in that time period. Wow. So, so it's actually way slower, right? Yeah. It's, it's significantly slower. It's, um, like a turn is a big deal, right? Yeah. A turn slower is a really big deal. And, and this, this is, is like pushing two, sometimes even three turns slower than your average set. Yeah. I should say like, if, if you look at just the average turns, then it's like one turn slower than your average set. 
um, if, if you just divide it by the average, but that's not the most useful way to look at it. Um, it's much more useful to look at where the bulk of the turns fall. And so it, you can typically expect a game of Constar here to last, you know, around two turns longer than than your average format. Wow! So. No wonder I've been having so much fun. Yeah, it's you get to play more Magic. Yeah, so. for sure. <laughs> so <laughs> more bang for your buck. And and two turns is a big deal. The difference between one turn and two turns is a really big deal because that's a whole land drop. Yeah, it's um, massive. Yeah, so it's. Like, um, well, and I want to say that the difference between especially these two turns, like if you're talking about turn eight and turn 10, yeah, that's, that's a big difference. I mean, how many, like we're talking about land drops. I mean, it seems like once you hit that eight, seven to eight range, maybe eight to nine range, it's probably easy to get up to the 11 and 12, which we'll see, which we see from cons just because you're not hitting a land drop on each of those turns. Yeah, exactly. It's one of the things that's crazy about uh, about um, like the difference between where, where a game is ending in turn seven and eight versus like nine to eleven is that in on turn seven to eight you don't deploy deploy your whole your whole hand in a typical game. You usually have one or two cards left in your hand. Versus in Cons of Tarkir, I find that I cast everything in my hand, you know, around 50% of the games that I play, something like that. Um, it's just, you, you cast everything. You play all your spells. It's, you, get to, you get to play magic and you get to deploy everything. You get to deploy the best that your deck has to offer. So, Okay, so, so with that in mind, you know, now we've kind of established, okay, this is a slow set. So what are you looking for, you know, as you look forward then after you've established that? Yeah, so this is the tricky thing about uh, about Cons of Tarkir um, specifically. Um, but one one general thing is that we say this is a really slow format. You know, nine to twelve. That's really really slow. But when you think about it, like that's fast. You only get to untap your cards, you know, eleven times, and then the game's over. It's mm-hmm. uh, and a lot of times people just don't realize how fast a game of Magic is, and so they'll look at something like. I don't know, like a JM Day Tuner's Tomb or uh, Tome or something like that. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to tap this and I'm going to draw like 15 cards off of it and it's going to be awesome. Um, or they'll look at like the last cards in this format and they're like, well, once I put 10 counters on my guy, then I'll be able to tap and, you know, it'll be it'll be great. Right. But that's not what happens. Like you, you'll uh, if you play something early, you an outlast creature, you're going to get to activate it maybe twice before the game is over. And this is a slow format. So it's that's one thing to keep in mind. And the other thing to keep in mind about cons of Tarkir is that while it's slow, it's this uh, cons I would describe as this struggle for board control from turn basically turn three through turn six or seven. And it's just about, you know, playing these things and trying to make sure that you can you can hold on to the board and not get overwhelmed. And you just it's this fight. It's like this arm wrestle. And if you can't add something to the board. If you miss your third land drop in Cons of Tarkir, you basically just die. You're basically because, dead, right? Yeah, exactly. Because they're just going to play, you know, creature, 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 creature. And you're a creature behind, maybe two creatures behind, and you'll never catch up and the game's going to be over. Yeah, especially because uh, of Morph. Exactly. Because they so, can attack you and then you sort of activation on almost any Morph if you're behind, take a bunch yep. of damage and keep developing their board. And then once they're out of gas, they just start flipping up their Morphs and you're just behind at every stage. Yeah, exactly. Once they – once when your opponent gets their morphs down before you and they're like flipping up their morphs before you, you just feel like you're just so far behind because you can't do anything. They're doing all this awesome stuff and you're like, well, I guess I'll wait till next turn to do something awesome. And it's it's really uh, – But you take to, five. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'll take five and the next turn I'll be able to untap my guy and I'll unmorph my guy and then I'll be able to block. and But then they're going to be untapped and they'll be able to cast something and who knows what's going to happen. And so um, I think that's really important because when, when people hear that cons is slow, I worry that they're going to be like, well, I'll just play all this expensive stuff. But I think that it's actually really important to play, play a lot of morphs, play a lot of two drops just so that you can establish that early board control. Um, I love playing a two drop because now I'm ahead on the board control even if I drew first. Um, because I play, I play my two one and now they've got to play a morph and I'm already able to attack. I'm already play, able to play my own morph. I have more creatures on the board. And so I'm, I'm winning that. I have an advantage in that, that arm wrestle. So yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Okay. So which along those same lines, I, I always play 18 lands in this format because it's, you just can't miss your land drops. I, I, and one of the things that I've seen is that when I have a five land hand with a morph, 
I'm going to keep it most of the time because I'm going to be able to do something on turn three, turn four, turn five, turn six uh, with that hand, um, even if I draw only one more spell. And so I like to have a lot of, a lot of lands in the format. Yeah, so. that that seems to have sort of jumped up and become the standard, I think. And, and I think that it being a slow yep. format is another indicator for that. Yep. All Agreed. right. Now, the next major section that you've hit here, and I think you do in every one, yep. is the popularity. Yep. And this one, you know, I think I think that when you were saying earlier about how, you know, your fear is that people will take too much out of the data that's been presented, I think this is what you were talking about, right? Yep, exactly, yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, it is a really interesting glimpse into the games that you watched. Exactly. Uh, I think that it's like – the popularity is section, it doesn't have that much bearing on what's good, um, but it's really important for processing the rest of the data that you see um, in in the article. Um, so, for example, in this one, we see that Obzon is drafted at like nearly 25% of the format. Um, dur- wow. During the sample, people were drafting it. It's like one in every, you, you have like two Obzon decks per draft. Um, and uh, a lot of them I was seeing like, uh, you'll have like four obs on draft decks per draft, and then you'll have like one or two in the other ones. But I, I saw plenty of drafts that there's four obs on decks in the draft, and it's just like, what are you supposed to do? You know, it's uh, everybody's drafting the deck, and so it's it's just a, a an entire tier above the next deck. But along those same lines, uh, I think it's really important to to make people aware, like. I can't see people's deck lists, and so I'm just basing it off of the cards they're playing, the lands they're playing, and the spells that are that they're playing. And so if somebody just doesn't draw any of their green cards and then they never play like any green cards in in the match over the course of the entire match, then I'm not going to be able to tell that they're playing green cards. You know, that's invis- that's invisible. Right. To me. And so that throws off the these numbers a little bit. Um it, I I I keep track of which ones are thrown off by that and I I see that it's usually around like 2% of the 2% of the sample um that I just can't tell. Um, but so do you just throw those out? So if I can't tell at all, then I'll just throw, throw it out. But I I estimate there's, that there's like another 2% that, that I just can't, that I just can't be aware that, um, that I'm not seeing. Um, so, so I, I can't throw that out obviously because I don't see it, but, uh, I just estimate that that's in there, um, more or less. So, okay. Um, so what else did you see from cons as far as popularity went? So uh, it, it's really interesting. I color code these things. And once I started doing that, it, it, things started becoming a lot more interesting because if you take a look at it, you see the three white decks are the top three most popular decks. Yeah, you can see it very and clearly then, on the graphic. Exactly. And then the three red decks are the next three most popular decks. And then the three blue decks. And then it's like green and black right at the tail end. Um, and so it's like uh, people like to draft white red basically. Well, the interesting so. thing that I, I see about the, – it's not the green black. It's actually the green blue yeah. Uh, I find that interesting that the the bot the two so Sultai and Teamer represent the third the fourth and fifth as far right. as the clans go. Yeah, which exactly. I think is interesting. It, yeah, it, I don't know. I I really like both of those clans, and so when I saw that, I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. But uh, I've seen over the past basically three years that people really like white red, um, just the color combination. Just um, and it's been really good. Uh, it's it's been really strong in all the all the formats that we've seen. Like it was good in Theros, it was good in AVR, it was good in, you know, it's basically good in everything. Um, and so people really like the deck, so it's not surprising to see that it uh, to see the white decks and the red decks kind of uh, showing up in, in more numbers than the other decks. Um, the other thing though is that like the Jeskai Teamer and Soltai decks, uh, they're all really close together, and I call it more or less a statistical tie. Like, oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we, we like, don't want to put too much uh, emphasis on the rank when they're effectively the same. Yeah, exactly. Like the difference between Mardu and Jeskai is, uh, you know, that's significant. But the difference between Jeskai Teamer and Soltai, they're all basically on the on the same in the same area. And who knows, you know, which one? Uh, yeah, st- just statistically, we don't know. So, and then we get to the bad news. <laughs> yeah, the well, I don't know. It's it's interesting because I, I have five colors showing up at ten percent. I know that's your favorite deck, um, and I know that a lot of pros love that deck. Um, I think that ten percent is a really high number for that deck. Yeah, it probably is. It's I. That seems I don't think really there's enough high. Lands for it. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's uh, so so. I crunched the numbers early on on like the lands, um, and you get like 
like four lands in this format on average per drafter. And so the five color deck wants like ten lands, right? Yeah, eight or eight to ten is what I've been eight to ten lands. So you you've basically got got to take all the lands from another player in order to get your your five color deck. Oh, man. <laughs> and so the problem is, is if there's another person that's trying to take all the lands of another player, things get pretty hairy. Um, and I know like. I just don't see lands in my drafts. Yeah, uh, I've, I've I've started seeing uh, far far fewer. I've my last <laughs> six drafts probably have been not five color. After doing, you know, probably twelve out of fifteen before that were five color or something like that. So yeah, like yeah, I draft a lot of Obzon, Teamer, and Soltai. And in those decks, like the straight clan decks where I'm playing basically two colors with a splash, I still want five or six lands, non basic lands in my deck. And so, which is still more than like what I'm allotted from for for my seat, um, which is four, is what you said on average, right? On average, and so I still want to get more of those, so I still take them really highly. But if if you've got a five player drafter in, in your draft, or if you are one, like <laughs> I always know, I, I look at my packs and I'm like, yep, haven't seen a land in like you know two packs. Uh, I must be sitting next to a five color drafter. Yep. Um, so and and. I'm always like, man, I wish I had one more land. So I keep taking them a little bit higher. And I think that's what everybody's doing is just like grabbing those lands up as fast as they can because you just don't see them later. You can't you can't pass them. Yeah, there's always somebody like me. Yeah, exactly. So one of the uh, interesting things um, that I've seen as well was uh, I, I've noticed that that I've, I feel like people don't draft the deck correctly. Oh yeah, it's uh, I, I talk about that because when we get down to like um, where uh, how much the decks are winning, uh, spoiler five color doesn't do very well, and that's one of the things that uh, that I think is I think that people just I think that it's a really hard deck to draft. Yeah, um, well, how about I I'll save that I'll save my opinions yeah. for that when we get to that. Um, and then so bringing up the rear here as far as remember this is just popularity. This is just what people drafted. This isn't speaking yep. to how well it performed. Is two color two color decks, which is. All ten t- two color combinations. Like I didn't separate them all out because it, wow, it's not like it's not a statistically significant sample for like how many people drafted just straight white black. But y- the other thing to keep in mind is that when I say two color, that's like no other colors in the deck. So no splashes. No splashes. Nothing. That's just okay. that's just straight two. Colors. Okay, fair um, enough. Yeah. So like to... a Mardu deck could easily be a red white tokens deck with like exactly. a Mardu exactly. charm in it and a pony back brigade or something. Yeah, and I think part of this is that with the non-basic lands, there's just uh, enough of them that it's so easy to splash a card just for free. Yeah, for like um, free or nearly free, especially with the morphs. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, so I don't think there's a, uh, I don't think there's that much incentive to go two color. Um, it's, I mean, it's nice to have that mana just always be always be good. But I haven't found that I have a lot of uh, I, like I don't find that finding my colors is that difficult. And so I, I can see why this is uh, showing up. So low on the list. Um, I, I do want to say I, I wanted I really wanted to break things down by like uh, the color combinations and then what are they splashing and break that all down. But it was just too impossible for me to see it. Yeah, you know, I started I was I started out tracking that and I was like, it's just not working. I can't figure it out. So I couldn't do that. So it's just the clans. But um, yeah, it's the two color. And these are almost primarily uh, two color aggro decks is the thing that I should say. You can't see that from the data, but just from what I was watching, it's uh, if people are drafting a two color deck, it's because they want to be really aggressive and just hope to throw everybody off balance. Uh, that's because the format is so slow. One of the things that I've seen is that when you have a really slow format, one of the best ways to pick up wins is just be really, really fast. Um, or if it's a really fast format, if you can just be a little bit slower than the, those decks. So if you want to be the control deck, that's a way to, to, to pick up wins. And so going the opposite of like, um, what the conventional wisdom of the f- format is can be uh, really effective. Yeah. And, and I think that that's usually one of the few first places that you'll see people go to after things start to settle. Right. You know, like, and and even if things start to settle, just means, okay, people are mainly playing three color decks, right? It's like, well, I'm going to try to go hard in the two color. I mean, week one, I heard people talking about, like, I'm going to, I'm going to draft a black white. Yeah. You know, I've got this warrior synergy and I'm going to, I'm going to try drafting that. And I saw that right away. So. Yep. Yeah. And I think it's really effective because if you can just win, if everybody else is playing three mana two twos and you're playing two mana two ones and two or three mana two threes and just your stuff is bigger, you're going to win the game. So. Okay. But, All right, so and, what's the next piece here? 
So the next piece is, uh, is I have some like data on other stuff for the popularity, but it's mostly irrelevant. Like it's mostly just for like looks pretty. Um, okay. So, so the next thing is kind of like, uh, the win rates, um, how, how much the decks are winning. So, uh, I have it by like colors and archetypes and what the decks are doing, um, and some graphs for that stuff. And, and so basically it's, this is match win rate. Uh, it's not game win rate, uh, okay. which I think is, is significant, um, because those numbers change dramatically. Um, you don't have to win that many, that many games above 50% to pick up like a high, uh, a high match win rate, um. So the, this, this is how they're performing over the, over the match. So um, we've got basically three tiers, which is like uh, Teamer, Two Color Decks, and Obson, uh kind of all in the same area, just below 60%, around 57%. Um, and then you have like the next tier, which is the other three clans, Sultai, Jeskai, and Mardu, which are all just below 50%, around like 48 to 50%. And then you have Five Color that comes in, you know, at 30%. So... Thirty <laughs> percent is really low. <laughs> so. That's miserable. Yeah, thirty percent is really bad. So, like, I could see people playing Sultai and Jeskai at you know fifty ish percent and feeling like, oh, I've got a shot or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But and who I mean, the heck is, is going to play five color at thirty percent? Yeah, and so this is one of the things when I saw this, I, I looked at five color, and here's the thing: is I know a lot of people love the deck. I was never a huge fan of it because I felt like it's just. Uh, like there's a lot of things that kind of have to work right, but if they do work right, it's a really good deck. Um, but so many people love the deck so much and they were just drafting it a lot. And I was like, well, maybe I should try this out a little bit more. And then I did all this data and I'm like, it's not doing very well. I don't know what's happening here. Like <laughs> these people can't all be wrong. Can they? So I put together some theories on it, um, on why what it are performs your well. Okay. So I have three theories, uh, three basically reasons why. Cause I, I have think a theory that- too, and I'm going to throw it at you after. Yeah, so so basically three reasons why I think that uh, it's performing so so badly in this. Um and number one is it's overdrafted. I think that people I think that uh, during this specific period of time when I put together the data, it was after a lot of people had said, you know, I really like five color. And so that affects the data in a in a big way. As soon as you, a, a deck like five color is very sensitive to overdrafting. So um an an example of the opposite is Obzon, which is I mean, there's just so many. It's so deep that it's not very very sensitive to overdrafting. It's you can have two or three people drafting it, and it's not going to affect it that much. Uh, whereas five color, if you have two people drafting it, the win rate's just going to plummet. So I think that's the first thing. Um, I think the next thing is that um, it's a deck that is really powerful. Um, like when you get down a, a couple secret plans and you just flip them all up and you're like draw 10 cards in the game, you feel like you're the best person in the world. So powerful. Exactly. You're just like, look at what I did. And when you have all these removal spells and you're just like, I can answer anything and you can't stop it. And it just, everything works your way. And you just play these games and you're like, I am the best mage ever. But then at the same time, when you don't, when you don't draw your colors, you know, you you miss like two colors in the game and you're like, well, I just got unlucky. And so um, I think that that affects the five color deck in a lot of ways in the way that people respond to it. Mm -hmm. Um, it, Not like it's inherent power, but I think that people overvalue it a little bit um, just because it feels really powerful. And I've seen this a lot. Like uh, a really good example of this was from um, AVR draft, the red white deck. Mm -hmm. Um, Because when the red white deck worked, it was just like the best deck ever because you could win on turn five and you're just like, look at this. I, this is awesome. But then sometimes you wouldn't draw things in the right sequence and you're just like, well, I got unlucky and didn't draw things in the right order. But it's important to not overlook that. Like I want to win the games where I get unlucky still. Um, and uh, like if I draw 13 of my lands, I still want to have a fighting chance in that game. Um, and so, um, that's one of the problems I see there. But I think the third thing, the thing that makes a really big difference with this specific deck is it's just really hard to draft. Um, and yeah. specifically with the lands, like I, I think that people don't know where to take the lands. They're trying to draft the deck and they either take the lands way too high and don't take anything powerful for the deck. And then they're playing just like just awful cards. And they're, they're playing like all these monastery flocks and which is a fine card, but you don't want, you know, four of them typically. And they're playing like, uh, I've seen so many of these five color decks playing the the two eight the yeah rotting mastodon <laughs> rotting mastodon. It's like well, I gotta have some cards, and so they'll have like they'll have like six really powerful cards in their deck, and then everything else is just kind of like uh, filler. 
Um, and so I think that happens a lot. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you'll have the deck that has a lot of powerful cards, but they took the lands way too low, and so they just don't have enough fixing, and they aren't able to cast their spells. Yeah. And so I think that uh, it's a very delicate balance where you take those lands. And if you don't have the feeling for it, like, narrowed down perfectly, then you're giving up a lot of edge in, in that deck. Yeah, I think you're. I think you you definitely hit it out of the park with your with your reasoning. I think the the your number one uh, is the most important thing, which is just that yeah. basically, like I I haven't actually sought this out, but I think the table might be able to support two five color drafters if the other drafters aren't prioritizing uh, prioritizing lands for their three color decks. Yeah, um, but I basically, right. I want to be the only one in five, and then everybody else is going for two or three. So they're going to take a few of my lands, uh, you know, for their deck. You know, they're going to open a, an on clan tri land. They're going to take it or whatever. But you know, right. for the most part, I'm going to pick up a lot of the chaff from them. So right. that's the first part. Is that, like you said, it's a fragile deck. It is very sensitive, and like that's why I don't draft it hardly at all anymore because I just know that the tide has turned on people wanting to draft it, and the incentive's not there anymore. Because you just can't not if you don't get the lands, the deck is garbage. Like it's complete garbage. So yeah, I, I have to, I have to really feel like, you know, I have to basically be given some type of reason to think that uh, that I'm getting lands because like. There's almost every single pack has a non-basic land in it. Like, what is it? Right. And I'm just guessing like three out of four or something. I don't know if that's actually true, but it feels that way when you're drafting. I think on average it's actually a little bit higher because like okay. it, technically you're going to end up with around 85% of your, your packs are going to have non-basic lands in there it. There we go. So, but you're going to have more like 60% that have two. So, right. Yeah. yeah. And so so you're going to see them. So like if I'm five picks into a draft and I've seen one non-basic, like I'm out. Right. Yeah. Right. Like I just don't, I feel like the person to my Can't right or the it. person yeah. to their right is taking the lands and I'm not doing it. Uh, but yeah. then the other thing I, I really agreed with was number three for you, which is that people aren't drafting the deck correctly. And I, I've seen people draft this five color deck and I'm just like, what are you doing? Like, yeah, I know. A, they fall for the trap that you said, which is they pick up the lands really, really highly, which is fine, but then they don't know which cards or they just don't get hooked up with the right cards and they end up just taking like garbage. And what's the point of, having five color garbage, right? You want five color right. awesome stuff. And so there are a few cards that you have to take over the lands. They're not, there aren't a lot of them, but there are a few of them. And if you don't know what those cards are, then your deck's just going to struggle. Exactly. And I feel like I've really gotten dialed in after having drafted this deck a lot to the type of cards that I really want for that. And the ones that I want, um, I want morphs. Morphs are huge. Like you just, you need morphs because yep. you got to be able to do something in the early stages. And the way the game often progresses is that you play morphs until you find the mana to start flipping up morphs. And that's really, really key in our action is that you play a morph without the ability to flip it up. But by the time you're done playing your morphs, you've now found some of the mana to flip up a couple of them. And then maybe the next one, um, cards like OBS on guide are absolutely huge. Uh, yeah. For a deck like that, because they do allow you to fall a bit behind and then come back, uh, which is massive. You know, the lifelink can be huge. Um, I want to cast really good defensive creatures. Um, cards yeah. like Monastery Flock is fine. But, uh, you know, that is one I'll play pretty often. Um, but yeah, it's but, a good card. It's a good I, card. I mean, I play it in my blue decks. The, the yeah. five and colors, it, and so. in my five colors, I'll play it too. Like if I need to, like, again, it's, it's a cheap it's basically my removal, right? Yeah. Um, but like Archer's Parapet is huge and anything with Death Touch is massive too. Well, yep, yep. not Merrick Nightblade. I, I actually don't like that card that much. Uh, I think it's fine, but like I'm not prioritizing that at all. It's but, really good in Obzon, but it's... Yeah, I think it's fine. I, I'm not, yeah. I've never actually been that excited by that card. I, sure, people, it makes sense. I mean, it costs four. Yeah, it costs four and then okay. you got to like dump mana into it. It's pretty cool. Like I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't cut it, I guess, but like yeah. anyway. Uh, but so there's that and then... Like, but like the Death Touchers, the the regular ones are huge. Ruthless Ripper is fantastic. Yeah, uh, I mean, awesome. I want that card all all day. Um, Air of the Wilds is an easy one for me. Yep. Um, you know, so those type of cards. And then on the other end, I want two for ones that affect the board. Basically, like I want cards like uh, like Warden of the Eye that lets me buy back a card. Right. Um, th those type of cards that can really just like reward me for having taken the risk of taking all these different colors and yeah and I, I think one more thing that's like an important ingredient is i think too many people don't draft enough ways to win the game 
Mm, um, sure. So they've got like this def- defensive stuff, which you need. But if you can't win the game after you've drawn ten cards, like that's not going to go so well. Yeah, so. and I mean, ideally, you're going to pick up a couple of really powerful multicolor cards that you get past or open just because other people can't play them. Right, and you know they can be anything from like you know Ivory Tusk Fortress up to like Necropolis Fiends or you know things that really just sort of close out the game. Um, so yeah, anyway, enough about that though. Uh, the key though on your, your win rate for the clans is that the five color was the lowest by a large margin with a really unacceptable 30%. So we've explored that, but what do you make of the top three teamer two color and Obzon all being essentially the same at, at, uh, what is it like 57% or so? Yeah. Yeah. More, more or less in that area. So I think the important thing here, like Obzon is the third highest on, on, in that group. Um, so, so it looks like it's a lot lower than it actually is, but they're all essentially tied. And the other thing to keep in mind is like, it was by far the most drafted deck. Wow. That is insane. Yeah. It's like, uh, as soon as I saw this, I'm like, wow, Obzon is really good. It's, I mean, I don't know that you can do it when there's four people drafting it, but if there's two people drafting it, I, I mean, I'm willing to fight for it. If there's one person next to me and Obzon, whatever, I'll just keep taking the cards. And I think a big part of that is that. Um, you basically have uh, a few different obs on decks. You have your white black decks, you have your black green decks, you have your white green decks. And all of those decks are really good. Like, it's, it, it doesn't matter which one of those you're in, it, it's really strong. And so if, I, if I'm in the black green obs on deck, and you're in the white green obs on deck, or the white black obs on deck, that's a little bit more aggressive and focuses more on warriors and might be splashing for like an obs on charm or something like that. So if you're on that deck and I'm on the more grindy black green deck, we're going to be taking different cards and both of those decks are going to be really strong. Um, and so I think that's why obs on performs so well, even though it's being drafted so highly. That's but, interesting. Yeah. It's, now what about uh, two color? With the two color decks, I mean, it's like how do it's you interpret to... that because of the fact that you've lumped them all together? Yeah, basically, um, because they're all base aggro decks, um, you know, people just trying to outpace the the other decks in, in the field. That's that's my opinion on it. Is that uh, the two color decks are people that are just uh, they're taking advantage of the fact that the rest of the decks are slower, and if you can get together a lot of really fast things, you're going to win a lot. But it's not that easy to do. Okay. Um, it's it's easy to say that to say just take all the aggressive stuff, but everybody wants two drops. You know, it's it's hard to get that deck, the really fine tuned two color deck together. So, I I mean, uh, I see that deck. I see that. I what, what it tells me is that if you want to draft something aggressive, it's a good way to go in the format because you can you can take advantage of the people that are going slow. But I, I don't know that you can actually draw any broad conclusions from from the two color decks. Um, as for Teamer, um, that's the that's the deck that I've kind of I was drafting a lot of uh, Obzon and Soul Tide decks, and I kind of have shifted over a little bit more in, into drafting Teamer decks lately. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why Teamer is good is because it has a lot of ways to fight the Obzon deck. Um, so if you're going up against like a quarter of the format is Obzon, then you want to be able to have the evasive stuff to get through the stalled Ob- Obzon board states. And I think that Teamer is really good at that. So interesting. Yeah. Teamer. All right. So looking, I see you have something for the colors here, but what I'm really curious about is sort of some of the conclusions that you came to as a result of having looked at your data. I see you've got a very succinct sentence to follow up those last charts. It says draft, savage, punch. Yeah, I think it's the best common. Okay. So. So talk to us about that. Yeah, you know, I had debilitating injury higher than it for basically the whole time, but man, it's savage punch kills everything. It's like, it's the the card that I always want to draw. If I have a four power creature, then uh, I feel like no matter what they play, I'm going to be able to deal with it in some way. Um, and a lot of the creatures in this format are like four fours or five fives, like the big creatures that you need to kill, or they're smaller than that, two twos. Um, and so Savage Punch, as soon as you have a four four, anything with three toughness can kill like ninety percent of the ninety uh, percent of the things that your opponent's going to play. Um, on top of it, you're going to get an extra two damage in. Um, and so I think that debilitating injury is the stronger card. It's just Savage Punch fits so nicely into what the rest of the format is doing. And it's uh, I think that green is the strongest color. And so it fits really well into that, uh, into green strategy. It uh, fits really well with the green creatures. And so I think it's the best common. I, I take it over all the other comments. So. Interesting. You know, I had a... Uh... Coming back from the Pro Tour, um, I randomly got seated behind um, Huey and Owen. 
Uh-huh. And uh, we were just chatting and they said, well, wh- what do you think about Savage Punch? And I was like, well, it's gone up for me, but I don't know. It, it's like pretty sweet. And they, they were pretty high on it at that time. Uh, yeah. And I think that they might have been onto something there. And it looks like you've come to a similar conclusion here. Yeah. it's uh, When I put together my list of like the my most drafted cards, it's Savage Punch and then um, uh, Highland Game. And mm-hmm. one of those is a little bit more powerful than the other one. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, it's uh, it's the common that I most want to most want to open. Um, and uh, part of that is like all the green decks performed well. So it, if you look back at the the win rate, you see like Teamers really high, Obzon's really high, and then Soltai comes in at like right around fifty percent. But I think that's a little deceptive because I think that all, all the good Soltai cards are getting taken by the Teamer and Obzon players. Like, it's, oh okay. Like, why be in Sultai when you can just be an Obs on or Teamer? Um, and so I think that's, like, artificially low. And so I, I, I just think that green's the best color. Um, and so I, I just want those big green creatures. I, I want – it has so many two drops. Um, and so you have a lot of things that you can play early early on. And then as soon as you drop something with four, four power, you just – you can play Savage Punch, get through their, uh, their biggest creature and attack for an extra couple of damage. And it, it's so easy to put them on the back foot on turn like four or five when you have a Savage Punch. So, All right. And With that said, man, uh-huh. it is not that good at breaking through stalled boards. Like, no, it's not. Yeah. So th- that, that's the tricky thing with uh, Savage Punch. Why like, isn't – the thing I don't understand is, is like is it just because the removal is so slow – like, shouldn't we be getting punished for a source, you know, like a sorcery clunky spell like Savage Punch more often where it's just like, oh, kill that thing in response? Yeah. Th- I mean, the problem is that uh, you force it away. Y- yeah. You have like force away, which is I mean, that's the scary one. You also have bring low, but it costs four mana and you have throttle that costs five mana. And I mean, the problem there is it's like. You can just look and see if they have four mana open. And if they do, you're like, well, not Savage Punching this turn, and unless you absolutely have to. Um, and the other thing is that because it uh, because Savage Punch doesn't say, like, target creature you control with power for greater gets plus two, plus two, and fights something. It's just, like, any creature you can do that ability on, you, you can use it on, like, a smaller creature and still kill something big yeah. without risking your big creature. And so uh, the temple, even when you get, like, a temple blowout, sure, it, like... It's bad. It's really bad. But it's not as devastating as, as it might be with a fight card in other formats because you're fighting with something smaller versus like yeah. normally you, when you use Prey Upon, you have to use your biggest thing. And if they if they bounce it, you're just like, OK, game over. So, right. So, yeah, you can at least hedge against that a bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, that makes uh, sense. The other reason why I love huh. Savage Punch is it kills like all the evasive creatures. Yeah, you um, can kill their stupid three th- – three two unblockable or whatever yeah or, or there are two ones and things like that and yeah. so uh, that that's really high value basically all the flyers die to it yeah exactly so huh. i like that card a lot that's so. interesting um all right so then we we skip down a bit to uh sort of your wrap-up section uh for right. your column which is the conclusions and recommendations yeah, so so I said like the the board gets stalled a lot, so you need to have ways that can punch through the board stalls, but you also need ways to kind of get into this uh to to get into the board stall in the first place and then maintain it and then win from there. Um and so a big part of that is that uh, I just always play 18 lands in this format and I always play first. Yeah, I do the uh, because, same. Because yeah, I want to get my morph down on turn 3 and then I want to unmorph it on turn 5 before my opponent can respond. So it's that that's one of the biggest things I've won so many games in this format just because my opponent missed land number five and I'm like, okay, well I guess I'll win. Yeah. So. You just like attack with everything. They're like block or don't. And then yep. you just have complete say over how much damage they are taking. You get to use your mana perfectly. I've had situations where I've attacked with a couple of morphs into their morph or, you know, smaller creature they block or don't. And I get to decide, okay, well let's say they didn't block. I can be like, well, I've got another card i can play so i'm just gonna have you take four or i can be like i'm out of gas here dump five mana flip up a snowhorn rider take seven and now they're still behind right and it just like that flexibility is so powerful you know you put that in my hands where i can now sequence things out in like a very specific way and really wring the most value out of all of my mana and all of a sudden i'm way ahead yeah, exactly. I, I do have to say one of my favorite plays from the other day. It was so great. I had two morphs down, right? My opponent has two morphs and he's tapped down. He's got one land untapped. And I've got my land sitting in hand. I've got four mana on the board. And I'm like, I could play this land, but I have this obs on turn in my hand. 
So I'm like, I'm not going to play my land. Make him think that I can't put my guys up. I attack. Obzon Charm. He blocks both of my guys. Obzon Charm, both of them. And it's just like he concedes instantly. So <laughs> That's amazing. Just, but yeah, having having that, being able to attack your morphs into their morphs is when you have open mana is so good. And so that's where I want to be in this format. Yeah, that's why um, I like Ruthless Ripper so much. Yeah, exactly. That's that why I like great. all Death Touchers so much, in fact, is that you can just yep. be like, I'll put, you know, put me to the test, like attack with the thing. I'll block. I know it's, I live in fear of Ruthless Ripper because like I, I attack with my stuff. And I'm like, if they have Ruthless Ripper, I'm going to put five mana into this thing and it's going to be over. The other one is the, um, uh, the Canyon Lurkers, man. I like that card a lot. I think it's pretty um, good too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, for, for like, uh, uh, just a creature, it's being able to flip it up for four mana and trade with something big is is a really big deal because they never expect you. The, the, everybody's always expecting you five mana. You know, I can do something about it. But when you flip it up and five power is just so big, it kills all, you know, it kills Snowhorn Rider. And it's just I love that card. So, yeah, that's sweet. And yeah, of course, it gets through our, our archer's parapet. So, yeah. And it's so that's basically where I'm at on the format. Um it, for for my own self, I dra- I draft a lot of, uh, like I said, a lot of green decks. Uh, the I want to be in green. I avoid uh, I avoid Jeskai more than anything else. I've drafted Mardu a few times because I like white bat white black reasonably well. Um, but I try not to be in Jeskai um, mostly because I don't like the blue red combination very much. And so I feel like Jeskai has a little bit too much of that. If if I'm more white blue. Or more heavily white with a little bit of red and uh, red and blue, then it's fine. But um, I typically rather do, just be in Obson or be in Teamer or something like that. So yeah, I always end up being in not red. Yeah, exactly. That's that's <laughs> me. So uh, and uh, like I'll, I want to draft blue green and splash the red cards, something like that. So yeah, I mean that being said, I I played in a PTQ on the weekend and and my sealed I played uh, Mardu. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll play whatever, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I put this article out and then my ne- very next draft, I hopped on and like, I, I was, had some obs on cards. I had some team red cards, a couple of soul tie cards, and I just kept taking lands because then there's nothing. And I ended up in five color and I was like, well, there you go. I should have looked at my lesson. <laughs> I guess, so. Right after writing the article of <laughs> exactly. 30%. Like, well, That's th- great. There you go. So, <laughs> All right. Well, good stuff, man. That was uh, that was a fun conversation. And uh, yeah, I certainly recommend people check out your column uh, on Pure MTGO. Again, I'll, I'll be putting a link uh, to that to the column and, and he comes out with one of these per per set. So yeah, usually I'll do like a spoiler analysis where I just get into um, people love those articles, but I don't know. I don't put much stock in them because it's before the format comes out and I'm just like, well, people want it. So I'll put it out. But uh, and then I do these uh, statistical analysis once per set. And sometimes I'll get like a follow up to it where I see how the format has changed. But it's just so much time and uh, it's hard to get that out. So, yes. But this one comes out every set either way. Yep. Yeah, I, I put it out. every. Well, I missed it for M15, but that's because I don't like core sets. So. Gotcha. Um, where can people find you otherwise if they like what they've heard or they want to uh, follow up with you? Okay, so uh, people can follow me. There's two main places. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at O-R-A-Y-M-W. O-R-A-Y-M-W. Uh, you can go on there and I'll you know tweet out when I've got an art- article up. But you can also talk to me and I'll I respond. You know I'll I'll talk to you about whatever and I like to have discussions about it. I feel like you know I put a lot of work into these articles, but they're nowhere near everything that I could say about it. Um, and I I love to talk about limited or whatever. Um, uh, the other place. Um, uh, I have a Tumblr where basically the Tumblr just exists so that there's an RSS feed, S feed. So if I, you know, if I put up an article, then I'll put it up on the Tumblr and you can see, oh, there's a new article. So that's a really good place to follow. Um, I also am on, I'm on the LR Reddit a lot. I'm also on, you know, the regular Magic Reddit, uh, just talking in there so you can see people, uh, you, you can see me in there and talk to me. Yeah, um, you're, you're actually one of the mods basically. for the LR Reddit. Yeah, exactly. So, and I I spend a lot of time, you know, just kind of trolling through those, trolling through those forums. Trolling so, in, in the fishing <laughs> sense or in the teasing yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> in in the fishing sense, I try not to do the other one, <laughs> you know, especially in the LR Reddit. I'm like mm, abuse of power a little bit, right? So <laughs> you might have to ban yourself. <laughs> exactly. That would that awkward. wouldn't work out so well. But, yeah, exactly. Uh, I um. I do have um, – my friend and I, Zach Ortz, we put together a podcast. We haven't put any episodes out for for a, for a while. We're kind of putting it on hiatus a little bit. But you can still found, find past episode, uh, episodes of it. It's called All in the Telling. It's not magic related. It's just about storytelling. Um, 
and we just talk about all kinds of stories and mostly genre stuff. So you can also find that um, and you know see what I have to say about that kind of stuff. So yep, I am a listener of that podcast as well. Matthew, thanks for taking the time uh, to come on the show. We certainly appreciate it. No problem. I, I was excited to come on. I was really looking forward to it. So. Yeah, it's great. Um, if you guys want to find me on Twitter, Marshall underscore LR is where you can do so. And of course, you can find everything related to the podcast, including links that I've talked about today uh, for the Patreon, all that kind of stuff over at LRcast.com. Thanks for hanging out, guys. We'll uh, We'll have another guest next week and we'll talk to you then. Bye. Elmer peered out from behind the branches. It looked safe. The river was there, not too far away. He looked at the sky, worried about a sudden downpour. The <laughs> skies were clear. He trotted down to get a drink. As he approached, he saw something glittering in the sunlight. What light near yonder river breaks? He trotted down suddenly, curious. Had she come? When he got closer, he saw it was her. She clicked her uh, glorious claws in anticipation, <laughs> and droplets of water twinkled like stars along her carapace. Elmer, she called with her click-clacking voice. <laughs> Shelly, he responded. He galloped toward her, and um, and she scuttled. They met on the sea sh- uh, on the river shore. <laughs> now we turn our case away, <laughs> that they might enjoy their bliss. We contemplate the flowers in bright colors, and the blazing glory of the setting sun, and the dark shadow that moves in the trees. Wherefore art thou, Elmer? Shelly said. We can never be together so long as your family disdains me. We could run away together, he said, and, and frolic with abandon on the seashore. They gaze uh, fondly at each other for a moment. Then Shelly clicked her claws in alarm. A looming figure ran charging towards them, either slightly larger than a bear or slightly larger than an elephant, depending on when the lightning bolt hits the graveyard. (laughs) Run, Elmer, Shelly shouted. It's the Tarmo! The end. (laughs) 